How is everybody? Good. Glad you guys got stuck with me during lunch, so I'll make you even more hungry uh, or sleepy, one of the two. Uh, I apologize that you get me instead of someone from Wells Fargo. She would be much uh, more entertaining than I am. Uh, I'm just a lonely old golf professional slash college professor. Uh, my name is Ashley Cox. Most of the world outside of the state of Mississippi knows me as AC. Uh, I have been a member of the faculty at Salt Lake Community College now since January of this year. Uh, and I'll talk about my path uh, to becoming a, prof a professor. Um, as Jen mentioned, I, she in incorrectly stated it. I am not a professional golfer. Professional golfers are the people that you see on TV. I'm good, I'm not that good. Um, I am a golf professional, so I teach the people that you see on TV. And I've had an opportunity to teach quite a few people uh, that have been on and off some of the mini and minor tours uh, through my years. So I'll start with who I am. Uh, I was born 7777. People go, why do you put your business in the street like that? Because I had the coolest birthday in the world. Because everybody remembers my birthday. It's so cool that I even got it tattooed on my arm. So I was born in Past Christian, Mississippi. Um, this is a picture of my wife and daughter. I currently uh, reside in Kearns with my wife and daughter. We're expecting our second child in March. So if you sign up for one of my classes in the spring, you'll get a few days off in March because I got to be at home uh, preparing for the birth of the second child. I was born in Past Christian, Mississippi on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I got to look at the beach every day of my life, so it was really nice for the first 18 or so years of my life. Here's my na two name drops that I always do when I give a presentation. One is, if you're familiar with Good Morning America, Robin Roberts on Good Morning America is from my neighborhood. So our families were close growing up, although Robin's a few years older than I am. And I went to a rival high school of Brett Favre. So since Brett's a few years older than me, um, we knew each other and we knew of the same people. So that's what's made my little town of Past Christian, Mississippi famous. Uh, I lived in Starkville, Mississippi for five years while I attended Mississippi State University. I'll talk more about my education in a minute. When I graduated from Mississippi State, I moved to Saugatuck, Michigan. So you can see there's a pattern in my life. There's beaches. So Salt Lake City needs to find a beach. I don't count that pond. Y'all count up the road there uh, as a real beach. I need a real beach for myself. But uh, I lived in Saugatuck, Miss Michigan, where I ran a golf course. Uh, called the ravines and uh, after a season in Michigan I decided I don't do snow and so I left Michigan and I moved to Bowie's Creek North Carolina where I taught at an institution called Campbell University from Bowie's Creek I moved to Raleigh while I worked at North Carolina State University from Raleigh uh, I took a short detour to Salt Lake City which I'll talk about momentarily and then moved to Denver, Colorado, where I spent the last four years prior to moving here in January of this past year. My education, uh, I went to St. Stanislaus College. It's a uh, college preparatory high school, all boys Catholic boarding school. I was not a boarding student, but I was a, uh, a attended an all, all boys school growing up, and that's the school that played against Brett Favre's rival, uh, high school uh, when I was growing up. Uh, I attended Mississippi State where I was enrolled in, at the time, one of four programs in the country that had a pro degree program called Professional Golf Management. Uh, there are now 18 institutions that have that same degree program. We were trained in the ins and outs of running the golf business, so not necessarily being tour players, people that you see on TV, but we learned how to actually manage a golf course, how to grow grass. I know a little bit about growing grass. I can't help you with your yard. I'm trying to fix my own yard, but I do know a little bit about growing grass, about retailing, about running tournaments, about teaching golf lessons, about managing a restaurant, about managing uh, events. So we learned some of everything. Uh, and our under, uh, underlying degree that we had was in marketing. So that was my first step into the world of marketing. After I left Michigan, remember I said I don't do snow, uh, I needed a place to go. So I returned to Mississippi State for one semester to work on my master's in business administration and I got a job opportunity at a university in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina uh, called Campbell University. In 1999, Campbell was accredited as a uh, 
PGM University by the PGA of America. So as our numbers grew from four in 1999, we grew to nine programs nationwide. Uh, Campbell needed somebody to be their assistant director. So at 23 years old, they jumped out the window and hired me to be a faculty member. So you can imagine the fear that I felt on the first day that I had to stand in front of a class and teach students my age or older. Uh, it was pretty intimidating, uh, to say the least. Uh, but if nothing else, I knew how to fake it until I made it. And so I let them know that, or they had no idea that I didn't know what I didn't know at the time, but that was my first move into education. And that was when I realized that teaching college is where I wanted to be. Uh, I still stayed on the fringes of the golf industry. I was still involved uh, as, a, as a professional uh, or a member of the PGA of America. Um, this is where I spent most of my time teaching some of the tour professionals that I had an opportunity to meet and work with. Uh, but my real passion was helping and teaching students. And so after seven years at Campbell, I decided that I would pursue a PhD in sports management. So I left my job at Campbell full-time. I enrolled in the sport management PhD program at North Carolina State University. Uh, I completed three years of coursework while I was at NC State. And then at the end of my third year, my advisor and I had a falling out. And in academia, if you have a falling out in your advisor, you lose. And so I was dismissed from the doctoral program after three years of coursework. So three years, nothing to show for it. Uh, and I needed a job, and I'll talk about that path momentarily. Uh, after leaving North Carolina State and coming here to Salt Lake Community College, I enrolled in uh, a Doctor of Business Administration program at George Fox University, which is in Portland, Oregon. It's a hybrid program, so 95% of it is done online. We spend 12 days a year in Portland in residency. So I go to Portland twice a year to spend time on campus working with the members of my cohort. My work experience. Uh, I started off at Mississippi State University Golf Course. As I mentioned, I moved to Michigan, where I worked at Ravines. For those of you that are familiar with Michigan, it was right here. For those, anybody that's ever met anybody from Michigan, they show you the hand, and they point out where that is in the state. So I was right here on Lake Michigan. Uh, and then my time at Campbell in North Carolina State, where I was both a doctoral student as well as a teaching assistant. And I mentioned that I left North Carolina State, not on my own, but because I was forced out. And so I needed to figure out what to do. Uh, oftentimes what happen to us, happens to us in life is that we face these challenges that we're not real sure what to do with. In that moment, I had to figure out where's the best path for me in life. But I couldn't just stand still. I had to find a job. So I took a position as the op morning opener at Lifestyle Family Fitness, a gym in Cary, North Carolina. And so every morning at 5 o'clock, I opened the gym. And I worked from 5 to 8.30 in the morning. And then I went to a second job at an organization called Global Value Commerce. Global was, uh, and still is, a distributor for seven online golf retail stores. And so I needed, again, a position. The job at Lifestyle was part-time. And so I needed another part-time job. And so when I started at Global, I started in the warehouse. I was on the pick, pack, and ship team. We were kind of Amazon for golf equipment and golf apparel. And, excuse me, the, uh, the CEO was doing some paperwork one day and he came across my resume and he saw my past and my background and my years of experience and he calls me in the office and he goes, why the hell are you working in this warehouse? And I said, I need a job. And he said, but you're way overqualified for this position. You're probably the highest educated warehouse worker in the world. And I said, yeah, but that doesn't mean anything if I don't have employment. So I have to take what I can take. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. You dust off and you move on. And so I accepted that position knowing that I could do better. But in that moment, I was in time of need. And so I took care of myself and my family by taking this position. And so the men at Global Golf decided, you know what, we need to do something with this young man to get him out of the warehouse so that we don't lose him to another organization. And so they approached me with an opportunity. And that opportunity was to move to Salt Lake City to open their Western Distribution Center. And at that time, I had no attachments. Uh, though my wife and I later got married, we were just dating at the time. So she could come with me or she could not. It was her call. 
And I packed up in February of 2012 and I drove across country and moved to Salt Lake City where I opened a warehouse right over on California. Still open today, so that was nice to see. Uh, I did that for three months. In May, I got a call from a company in Denver, Colorado, called Golf Tech. Golf Tech was founded by two guys that I happened to go to college with. Golf Tech is the golf industry leader in golf instruction. And they asked me if I would be willing to come on board to be their corporate trainer and recruiter. So there are a lot of golf professionals that have a lot of knowledge, but there are not a lot of golf professionals that have knowledge in how adults learn. Well, my 10 years of experience in teaching college gave me plenty of insight into how to best teach adults. So they brought me on to help improve their education program as well as to recruit from the PGM institutions that existed because of my relationship with them. And so I did that for four years and then Golf Tech had uh, decided to make some changes internally. And the person that brought me on board, remember I said it was founded by two guys. One of the co-founders and I are very close friends and he's the reason that I went to work for Golf Tech. Well, he and the board of directors at Golf Tech had a falling out, and he was pushed out the door. And as is typical when you have turnover, this is the sports side of me coming in. For those of you that are familiar with how sports work, when you fire a coach, you don't necessarily fire the entire staff, but you do give the new coach an opportunity to bring in his own staff. And so when the COO was let go, that gave the CEO, who was one of the co-founders who stayed on, to run the place, the opportunity to eliminate people that he didn't hire. So it's not that he didn't like me, it's just that he didn't think that I was the right fit for his organization. So in May of last year, my position was eliminated and I was let go. And so again, I needed a job. And so I took a few months and I had an opportunity because of unemployment to be able to sit back and decide what do I want to do. And I used to tell my students all the time, don't take an opportunity as a job. Look for a career. Do something that you enjoy. If you have to wake up in the morning and go, I don't really feel like going to work today, then you're not in a position that you enjoy. And so I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and finally this opportunity came open at Salt Lake Community College. And so I hopped on a plane and I flew over and I interviewed and they liked me well enough to give me this opportunity. And so I took, the, took advantage of it and I packed up my family and we moved from Denver to Murray where we lived for a few months until we could find a house. And so I am now here and I am enjoying, enjoying my time at Salt Lake Community College doing something that I love to do. So this isn't work for me. This isn't a job. If you haven't figured it out yet, I love being on stage and I get to be on stage every day. And I get to influence the minds of you people, our future leaders. And I get to help you try to understand things from a different perspective. These are all pieces of my career path that have make, make me enjoy what I'm doing. So it's not a job. This is a career. And so I want to give you guys a few lessons learned that I've picked up along the way from both business and industry and in sport. And one is motivation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a difference in being a professional golfer and a golf professional. I chose to be a golf professional because I wasn't motivated enough to put in the time, energy, and effort to be a professional golfer. And that's okay, because it's not the right fit for everyone. I felt like my skill set was better suited to helping people play the game better, not necessarily suited to people watching me play. So I didn't have the desire to do it. But that didn't mean that I didn't have desire at all. I focused my energies and my areas of expertise on helping people play better golf and ultimately having the opportunity to become a faculty member at three institutions. I get to focus my motivation, my energy on helping you learn, even if it's just a little bit, you learn something. One of the things that we used to teach people not only in golf but in my time in the fitness industry is that uh, if I add a half pound of weight to the bar more than the last time I picked up a bar that's a record and I need to take those small records and, and appreciate them for what they are I don't need huge jumps to improve 
any improvement is improvement. Same thing in the golf swing. I'd have people come to me all the time and say, well, I want to get better at golf. Well, what does that mean? What does get better mean? It's different for each person. So we had to clearly define what their goals were and then what motivated them to choose those goals. And then if their goals were, I want to break 90 when I play golf and they shoot 89, you celebrate that because that's an improvement over what you did the last time. Ambition. It would have been very easy for me to sit back and say, well, I guess my life is over now that I've been kicked out of this doctoral program. What am I going to do? Oftentimes people lose faith and they lose ambition. I couldn't lose that. So I knew that I had to get employment. And it didn't matter what it was. Just because I was highly educated didn't mean that I was better than. So I needed to get up every day and have the ambition and the drive and the desire that I, knowing that I don't want to open this shop or this, uh, this gym at 5 o'clock in the morning. And knowing that I don't want to have to deal with the perfume bomb that comes in wearing entirely too much perfume. And I don't want to have to deal with the weird guy that comes up to me and he says, the time changes this weekend. Yeah? What time are you guys opening? 8 o'clock? But the time changes. Okay? <laughs> so why aren't you changing your time? 8 o'clock 8 o'clock. And he just stared at me. And then he turned and walked out the door. And I looked at other people and I go, did that just happen? <laughs> but I had to deal with it because I had the ambition to do better eventually. I couldn't sit still. I had to have drive. And so I continued to follow that. Vision. Knowing where you want to be. Raise your hand if you have a five-year plan. A few of you. The expectation should be that every person in this room raises their hand because you should have a five-year plan. You should know where you're going to be headed. And even if you have bumps in the road, that doesn't mean that you can't continue to strive to get to where you want to be. But if you don't have a plan right now, it's just a wish. We don't want wishes. We want goals that can be accomplished, that fit into your vision. So find a vision and have a vision of where you want to be. And when you get to that one point, you may realize this isn't necessarily where I thought I wanted to be. So I'll move on. Never stop learning, never stop engaging, never let that vision die out. Charisma. These two go hand in hand, so I'll put them up together. Charisma and confidence. In my time as a recruiter with Golf Tech, one of the things that I noticed from the majority of the people that I interviewed is that they were so afraid to talk about themselves. You know, at the very beginning, Jen said, which side of you is your best side? And I said, I'm good from either side. And somebody said, I wish I had that self-confidence. You should have it anyway. As my mother used to tell me, God don't make no junk. Be proud of who you are. Stand up for what you believe in, in your own abilities. There's a difference in being confident and being cocky. And I tend to border on both. Because I'm extremely confident, but I can be cocky at times. But in thinking about sports, because I inevitably get asked, what's wrong with Tiger Woods? Since I'm a golf pro, Tiger's a golf pro. What's the matter with Tiger Woods? And I'll tell you that Tiger Woods has lost his charisma and confidence. Primarily because he's injured. He's physically broken. His body cannot operate the way that it did for the number of years that he's played the game. And so he has to make some changes to his body to take better care of himself. But the other piece is that he's lost his confidence. There was a time when Tiger Woods, I've been at tour events with Tiger Woods. And Tiger Woods walked up on the first tee, or excuse me, on the practice range, and he looked at every single person on the range with the same look that, I'm going to break your neck today. And those guys feared him because he had already proven that he could do it. And then Tiger was playing in a tournament in a, in a major championship. I can't remember the exact year, but he got beat for the first time in a major by uh, Y.E. Yang. And that showed everybody on tour that Tiger was, infa was not infallible, that he was fallible, that he was not invincible, that he could be beaten. Because let me tell you something, Y.E. Yang beat Tiger Woods in that tournament, and Y.E. Yang I don't think is anywhere near the PGA Tour anymore as a player. 
even though he has a major championship, he's gone. For that one day, he was better than the best. That hurt Tiger because he didn't know how to lose. Because his father had bred in him a confidence and a charisma that made other people fear him. It bordered on cockiness, but it made him successful. And you need to do the same thing in your career. Understand what your strengths are. Pay attention to your weaknesses and work on those. Your weaknesses should be opportunities to become strengths for you. And then pay attention to the external threats. And those threats can be anything. Could be a desire to like a drinking party too much. I've been there. Could be a desire to like to run the streets at night. I've been there. Those are threats that can hold you back. Prioritize things in your life so that you know which direction you can go in. And then be confident in your skill set. Because nobody can tell you whether you're good or not. I was watching a documentary recently that talked about the pain addiction that people have to pills in the United States. And the doctor made a very pertinent point. He said, who am I to tell you how much pain you're in? I can't get in your head. So who am I to tell you you're not good enough? But if you come to me and you don't act like you're good enough, what am I going to think? You're not good enough. So you've got to have confidence in your abilities. And you have to be open to tell people, I'm good at this. I'm not so good at that. But I'm willing to learn to be better. A few things from business. You work in an industry, get to know and take good care of the administrative assistants that you work with. In any organization, these individuals are the lifeblood of the organization. They're the people that run the place. They may not get paid enough, and they may not get the recognition that they should get, but they are the reason that the business stays in business. So be, be nice to them, get to know them, and take good care of them. Understanding what it means to acquire employees. And you go, well, why do you want to put this up here? Because it comes down to making sure that if you're in a position in a business that you're hiring and retaining the right people. We fight this here at the institution as well, retaining students. It costs more money for organizations to hire new employees than it does for them to keep new employees. As a recruiter for Golf Tech, every time they put me on a plane to go recruit people, that costs us money. So if I have to continually fly to Phoenix to replace people at a single store because the owner, it was a franchise, the owner doesn't know how to treat his employees and there's constant turnover, that costs the entire organization money. So pay attention to the cost of acquisition employees and know that it's your responsibility as the leader in the organization to teach and train people and retain people. <laughs> Show understanding and empathy all the time. You know, it's, it's one of the big differences that I've experienced in my brief time here at a community college versus being at a four-year university is that the students that I've met so far are far more driven to succeed than the ones that I had at a university. And I think part of the reason is, is many of the students here are here because it's their money that's paying the way. It's not mommy and daddy saying you have to go to college. So there was a different drive in the students that I've experienced here. That also means that there's a lot more life going on with those individuals. What do I mean by that? You may have a family that you're trying to support while you're going to school. You may be working full time while you're going to school. You may be homeless and nobody knows that, but that's a struggle. As a faculty member, we have to show understanding and empathy for our students because it's our responsibility to retain you. And when you become an employer, it's your responsibility to retain those employees by letting them know that you care about them and their well-being. And that ultimately, if they're happy, that's what adds to your bottom line, not just having great business practices. It's having employees that you can love and that you can keep for an extended period of time. 
Couple things for in sports and in business. It's unfortunate that ethnic minorities are always fighting an upward battle. We have to fight a little bit harder to get the same type of recognition as others. There have been studies that have been shown, that done, that people of ethnic minorities with same qualifications don't get the same opportunities. We have to continue to fight that. It's your responsibility to be a change leader to get to know people that are diverse, that are different from you. And then when you are in a leadership position to hire people, not purely based on the fact that they're diverse, but if you've got two candidates that have identical characteristics, pay attention to whether or not this minority helps you. Because once you get that person, they're going to stay with you longer. They're going to be more committed and they're going to be more loyal. Same thing with women. Um, been some interesting things happening in the news here lately. You guys familiar with, uh, particularly in sport, familiar with the issue that the U.S. women's national team is having in terms of pay. The U.S. women's national team makes significantly less money than the men's national team, even though the women's national team could probably blow the doors off the men's national team on the field. There's one big issue that nobody talks about, and I'm not saying that this is fair, I'm just saying this is the reality of it. There's one big issue that we don't talk about, is that the, unfortunately for the women's national team, they signed a bad contract. At the time that they signed the arbitration agreement for their organization, they weren't making as much money as the men because they weren't as popular as the men. Problem is, is that when they became more popular, they were still bound by the contract that they were under. So you've noticed there was a, a stink about how the little women make compared to the men and that's died off because they realize they can't change that right now. They're contractually bound. That'll change next year. But the simple fact that somebody decided to write it into the contract anyway that they were going to make less shows you the lack of respect that they get. And that's a problem. And another problem that exists, uh, I was watching the Olympics. I, I, I don't pay attention to the uh, Winter Olympics because I just don't, I don't ski. I don't care about snow. Uh, you know, people say, why'd you move to Salt Lake City? You ski? No, I, don't, I hadn't even water skied in years. That doesn't mean I don't like being here. But I watched the Summer Olympics. And as I'm paying attention to the Summer Olympics, I realized that golf came back to the Olympics this year for the first time since the early 1900s. And one of the reasons that they decided to bring golf back to the Olympics is because they wanted to help grow the game. There was only one problem. They chose professionals to play in the event. So the men that played in the men's portion of the golf in the Olympics, it was like watching a mediocre European tour event. These guys are on TV every week. So if you follow golf, you already know who they are. And there was not enough, uh, nobody in the field that really was a major draw to get that many eyes on the game. But the bigger piece is where they put the women's golf. Women's golf was played the last week of the Olympics. You realize the Olympics is three weeks. We're super excited to watch the opening ceremony. We're super excited to watch the gymnastics, to watch the swimming, mainly because of Michael Phelps this time around, and Katie Ledecky this time and probably next time around. We watch the track and field. And all that other stuff, unless you're just a sports junkie, you don't pay any attention to it. The men's golf was played at the same time as the gymnastics, the swimming, and the track and field. So in thinking in terms of behavior of consumers who watch sport, they're already watching because of gymnastics, track, and swimming. So when golf is on, they stay tuned. The women was week three when people had Olympic fatigue. It was uh, opposite the speed walking, which I'll yet to know how that became an Olympic sport, but somebody got a medal for it, so good for them. And so if you think about how women are treated, if you want to grow the game of golf, put the women at the same time as the gymnastics, as the track, and as the swimming, so that while there are eyes on TV, there's eyes on them. It got lost in the back page, which too often happens with regards to women. I teach all things marketing, uh, primarily uh, consumerism, sales, 
uh, professionalism in business, intro to marketing, customer service, and the marketing capstone course. Who was my favorite to play against? My favorite uh, professional, nobody knows him, but we had some fun battles. His name is Hunter Haas. Uh, Hunter played at the University of Oklahoma. He and I are the same age. Uh, we talk about confidence and charisma. So Hunter and I played each other in a money game one time, and I'm not going to get into the details of the money game about who won what or what all happened, but it was, it was contentious to say the least. Um, but that was prior to Hunter being on tour full time. And then Hunter made it to the tour, and I happened to be at a tour event in Raleigh, North Carolina, working with a player. And Hunter came walking on the tee. And understanding that this is a guy that I could beat, so I didn't think he was that good, but he made it to the tour. And as he's walking on the driving range, he's walking with that same confidence and charisma that Tiger Woods did. And within two years, this was on the web.com tour, so he wasn't on the big tour yet, he was on the mini tour. But in two years, he had not only made it to the PGA Tour, but he also won on the PGA Tour. And so it was a neat story to watch a guy that wasn't that good but believed in himself and believed in his confidence actually make it. There's another guy, he's a friend of mine, he's going to be on the PGA Tour next year. Uh, his name is Brad Fritch, and Brad's from Canada. Brad and I used to play a lot of golf together, and uh, there was a stretch there where Brad was like a personal ATM for me in terms of how much money I was able to take on, off of him on the golf course, and now he's on the PGA Tour. So, you know, these are guys that they're talented. Uh, they could beat me today because I don't practice and play near enough to compete, but shows you what having personal belief and confidence can do for you to improve. I've always lived my life with the belief that you have to look, live life through the windshield, not the rearview mirror. And that's the reason why the windshield's way bigger than the rearview mirror. So I took any issues that may have arisen in my life as bumps in the road, not necessarily as roadblocks to stop me from being able to get to where I needed to go. None of my roads were closed. I just might have had to take a small detour to get back on the main highway. But I've always believed, my mother used to tell me, always let somebody else tell you no. So when you have a question, or if you, if you want to do something, ask if you can have that opportunity. Let them tell you no. Don't assume, well, I'm not good enough for that. When I applied for the job at Campbell as a 22-year-old, because at the moment that I submitted my application to that university, I was 22 years old. That's like shooting in the dark. I had no idea whether or not they would take a chance on hiring me to start to work there at 23. But if I don't submit my application because I'm afraid, what happens? I don't have the opportunity. So I submitted it. They could have said no, and I just move on. We tend to be afraid of the word no as a society. It's just two letters. It's not like it's the first time you've ever heard it. You can't let it end your path. You just say, okay, and move on. How sports prepare you for business? Well, I will say this. If you, watch, if you don't watch sports, I think you're missing out. I am a sports fan, uh, but I watch sports because it's much deeper than what's going on in the field. I tell my classes all the time, sports is the only reality TV. That stuff that you watch is reality TV. My wife and I fight about this all the time because my wife, I think, is a fairly highly educated lady. She has a master's degree in special ed. And sometimes I'll come home, like tonight, because I teach a night class, I'll get home tonight and she'll be watching, um, what's the one she's, the current one she's watching, I'm drawing a blank, but she'll be watching some stupid, there at times it was uh, Bachelor in Paradise. And I go, what are you doing? And she goes, well, it's, it's just, it's hilarious. I go, you're getting dumber by watching this stuff, but that's reality TV. No, sports is reality TV because what sports teaches you is that I can have a plan, but I better have a contingency plan as well because no matter how well I prepare, things don't always happen the way that they happen on paper. 
For instance, this week, the U.S. is playing the Europeans in the Ryder Cup. On paper, this time around, the U.S. should blow the doors off the European. But that has not been the case for the last five Ryder Cups. The Europeans have owned the U.S. But on paper, which is what we do when we plan in business, we say on paper it's got to work this way. And oftentimes what happens to people is they go, oh, it didn't work that way. Now what do we do? They have no clue. So you have to be properly prepared with contingencies. To me, sports helps teach that. Um, having spoke with Brett Favre before, and he said this on TV, and you've heard this from some other athletes, the good ones think the great ones do. So Brett Favre, as an athlete, he knew how to watch the plays develop. The thing that made Brett Favre so great is that he could improvise when things didn't go the way he wanted them to go. And I think in business, you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to say, okay, we have to make a change immediately. Are we capable of doing that? And so part of, for me, sports brings that. Understanding how sports work. Uh, I'll give you an example of sports not being scripted and it being awesome. Uh, just this week, on Sunday, the uh, Miami Marlins lost a pitcher, 24-year-old pitcher. He died in a, uh, in a uh, boating accident. And for Major League Baseball, he was a popular young player. For the Cuban-American community, he was an extremely popular young player because he came from Cuba. He went through the proper channels. He learned how to speak the language uh, almost fluently. So he was doing all the right things, and he is gone too soon, died in a boating accident. On Monday night, the Marlins had to play a game. See, just like in business, the world doesn't stop. You got to keep moving. And so they go to take the field, and one of the players on the Miami Marlins, his first at bat, he hits his first home run of the season to start the game. And he did it with tears in his eyes. And he said after he hit the home run, I haven't hit a ball that hard in batting practice. He goes, I did it for my friend. I'm glad I could give it back to him. Right? That's improvising, so to speak. That's taking advantage of an opportunity that exists. That's why I love sports. You can't script that. I thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity. For those of you that hate sports, I'm sorry I bored you to death. You take my classes, guess what? You're going to hear a lot of sports. <laughs> Thanks, Jim.